Okay, I'll start with a shameful confession. My knowledge of perfume extends to my time in the travel business when I would ask the air stewardess on the flight home to pick a bottle from her trolley for me to take home for my wife. So no need for sniffing a sample at time as I truly couldn't tell the difference. It's ignorant, I know it's ignorance, and not full on nose blindness, because I'm okay with wine. So why am I today so excited about interviewing one of the world's leading niche perfumers? It's because she's reached such prominence and recognition, yet still fully owns her business after 20 years. She's disrupted the world of perfume. She's synonymous with continuous innovation, exceptional quality, and superb customer service. So, which business channel host wouldn't want to interview a person with so many credentials? Let me welcome the owner of Almond Jane Perfumery, Linda Pilkington. Welcome, Linda. Hello, Malcolm, and thank you very much for such a lovely introduction. <laughs> it's true, though. It's true. Before we get into our main questions, though, please give us a short interview of uh, a short overview of Almond Jane Perfumery, what you make and what you sell. Okay, so we're a British independent perfume house. We manufacture ourselves. We make perfumes and candles. We're both retailers and wholesalers, and we have distributors all around the world. Excellent. Now, it seems to me, you know, a, a lack of knowledge mail, that it's a crowded world out there in perfumery. What makes you stand out from the competition? Well, the difference between niche perfumery and your high street perfume, especially for Ormond Jane, is um, the investment is all put inside the juice, inside the bottle. So our cost of goods are far more expensive than any other brands on the high street. Our whole investment goes into the development, the creation of a special perfume using absolutes, so our, um, our investment is literally in the perfume. It probably costs us about 400 to 500% more than let's say your regular bottle of perfume. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what gives it you know, that big point of difference. We have our own laboratories and studios and we, may, we manufacture everything ourselves out in Kent. So that's, our, you know, that's, what, that's what makes us quite different. Great, in the Garden of Eden comes, uh, and Garden of yes. England comes, yes. Yes. So it's not just perfume for women that you make, but men also. Is it easy to transcend creation between the two? Well, when I first started out 20 years ago, it was very much male and female. And um, I had quite a few um, experiences um, with clients who absolutely adore perfume. They come to the boutique, they sit down, they want to talk about perfume for hours, which is great. And we have a proper consultation. But what I've learned from this is that um, um, separating the male and the female was a mistake. And I can tell you a few stories about that later on, if you like. But ultimately, what I realized was that you know, a gentleman can enjoy uh, a floral perfume as much as a woman can and vice versa a woman might enjoy a spicy perfume so it's all about really just making a beautiful creation and then not really pigeonholing anybody into this is for you or this isn't for you allowing them to decide for themselves which is probably the best way to go about doing it actually Mm, excellent. Now, when researching for our interview, one philosophy that you have that immediately jumped out from me, and I think more businesses should adopt it, is especially those who have become complacent a bit, you are always asking, can we do better? How, when and where yeah. do you apply this philosophy? Uh, probably at every single level. Um, I think I am that way inclined anyway in my nature. Um, so when we're coming to the end of, let's say, carrier bags or ribbons or overcaps, bottles, or, you know, oils, I always say to myself, okay, this is an opportunity. Before we reorder, is there anything we can do better? I mean, are the handles on this carrier bag strong enough? Are they nice enough? Is it the right shade of orange? Can we make them softer to touch? So I, I have the opportunity before I order another 20,000 carrier bags, I can say, okay, what can we do? 
over caps? Can, the, can it clip on better? Um, you know, what's the quality of this jasmine absolute? Is there better on the market that we don't know about? So I'm always going to that, um, what can we do better? Because it, what's make, it, it's actually what makes me tick and what makes me happy. Hmm. I got you there. So when you were evolving a new perfume, do you do it by instinct or by visualizing your clients and their needs or by intense market research? Well, it's a little bit of everything, actually. Um, I have to listen to my clients. So people that come into the boutique, if they say something like, you know, have you got something with a lot of patchouli in it? And I haven't. I make a note of that. Um, so I'm always looking to see what's missing from the collection. I like to get the feedback from the clients that are Ormond Jane shoppers. Quite often, sometimes it's just pure inspiration when I might be traveling somewhere exotic and wonderful, might be in Vietnam or Laos, and I might just see something exceptional or there's a new oil on the market. Sometimes I get sent samples from all over the world from growers as far back as Madagascar and they say, you know, we've got this oil, it's a lychee oil, we, we, manage, you know, we, we extract it ourselves. So it, it all comes together with always want to, wanting to be more creative, more innovative, and a little bit more exciting, because uh, actually we like that, you know, because that's what makes us tick. You know, we're all very, you know, what can we do? What can we find? And then if I, if I do come across a new oil in an exotic place, you know, we're all buzzing with excitement. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that. I can, <laughs> I'm getting yeah. the feeling myself, and I don't <laughs> understand. Right, tell me about your exciting new range, La Route de la Soie. I think I presented Rue de la Soie. Yeah, which I believe will yeah, be on sale yeah. at the end of 2020. What's the collection and what's the backstory behind the choice of name? And, and please correct my pronunciation. No, the pronunciation was very good. Um, so uh, I have actually been on the Silk Road, but not as one long trip. Um, I've been to most of the countries. A lot of these countries are ex uh, USSR. So, you know, they were closed for a long time. Ultimately, it's my uh, ambition, as soon as travel gets to normal, I'm going to do the whole Silk Road again in one trip because um, I think it's absolutely fascinating. There's more than one journey. There's six different routes. But I got a book. Um, uh, it was, you know, it was all about the Silk Road. It was about, you know, everything that came from that neck of the woods to Europe. And I found it absolutely fascinating because I, when I went to school, I was just taught everything about all our battles, you know, Henry VIII and all that. And I didn't know, uh, you know, uh, mathematics, gunpowder, all these things actually came from these regions. So I was thinking to myself, I, I need to do a bit more research on this. I bought a few more books and then I bought a book on all the flowers and everything that grows um, right across this, this, this journey. And then I just thought it would be really good to create a set of perfumes that's connected to, to the Silk Road. So we've got like Damas, Angers, um, uh, Lavant, and it's all going through that whole reason. We've got Indus, Zian, um, Muscat. So it's all uh, connected. And it was like a massive jigsaw puzzle because I had all these ingredients. A lot of it was gourmand, actually, which is a big departure from our usual style. Um, you know, so we, we've got perfumes now with apple and rum, things like this I've never worked with. So people who know my brand will be quite surprised when they smell um, this collection. But then it was a case of putting this whole jigsaw puzzle together and allocating them to the right region and making sense of it all. So it was a big project. It took about two years. And um, I went off to a company in, in, in grass called Expressions de Parfumé. And I sat there with the people there to discuss what ingredients they had. And ultimately, it all came together. I was meant to actually launch it um, across America. I was meant to go to New York, Texas, Beverly Hills. But then um, the COVID hit. And I was, then, I was meant to then go right across Russia. So it was quite a unique situation for me because I've never launched a perfume on Zoom before. So Sarah, our PR lady, she was absolutely brilliant. She sort of stepped up to the mark straight away. And she goes, look, I'm going to send samples out. People can smell them and talk to you. So you're going to launch this on Zoom. So I was like, okay, I, I have to say, technology is not my strength. It never has been. So 
other than having a nervous breakdown before my first one or two Zooms and, you know, thinking, oh, this is all going to go terribly wrong. Actually, I've really got used to it. I, abs I absolutely love it because I can yeah. talk to everybody all over the world. It's fantastic. So the mm. first few mm. of the Rue de la Soie have been launched and the rest are going to be launched at the end of the year, 2020, because we just want to see what's going to happen. If we're allowed to travel again, then I will go out and show it. But if, if we're in the same situation or it's not advisable, then you know, maybe the rest is going to get launched via Zoom as well. Yeah, I, I can yeah. just see um, um, a whole string of things going to happen. The Sunday Times are going to do their own um, uh, Silk Route uh, tour. <laughs> this is <laughs> following your perfume. And Zoom are going to come out with Smelly Vision. So therefore... Yeah, oh, can... I wish they did. Do you know what? I, it's yeah. something that's been... I've been dreaming of... Um, being able to smell via your computer. And also, um, when I was having uh, the last shop fit at my boutique in Old Bond Street, like before when you were saying, can we, always, can we do better? So I was saying to the architect who was designing the boutique, um, is it possible that people can come into the boutique and there'd be like a, a virtual reality wall with flowers and they touch the flower in the air and the scent will come out all over them and he said no <laughs> so, <laughs> so, i'm sorry <laughs> i can't uh, do that but i you know you have all these ideas of you know of, yeah. of, you know what, what the future might look like i'm sure that it will happen soon look i get a I'm feeling sure. i get a feeling buying a quality and luxury perfume such as you offer is an experience an investment yes. like a fine wine rather mm -hmm. than a purchase if so, how should someone go about selecting that investment? Well, it is, it, first of all, it is an, in, an expensive purchase. It is an investment. And we like to have a consultation. So, you know, in other times, we would invite people into the boutique. If they were out of London or they, it was abroad, um, we would offer a consultation over the phone. We would send samples when they had the samples. We again, we'd get on the telephone and talk through. We would like ask them maybe over the phone, what what's the perfume for? Is it for day? Is it for night? Is it a signature perfume? Is it for a special occasion? What makes you tick? What do you like? Do you get excited when you see the sea, or do you get excited when you see the mountains? And what type of food do you eat? Do you like spicy food? Do you like um, sort of clean food with salads and and, and watery foods? Uh, what are your favorite colors? So we get a good um, perfume portrait of, 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 our, of our customer, our client, and then we take it from there. Once they've got, you know, once they've started trying our perfumes, we can chat to them. Sometimes, you know, they get in touch again, we get in touch with them, and, it, and, and the relationship goes on like this. So I opened my boutique 18 years ago in Old Bond Street. I've been going for 20 years, but it's 18 years, the boutique. And uh, clients that were coming in 18 years ago that I was serving still come in today, 18 years oh, later. Yeah. So it's great. You know, we've got a database of over 50,000 people. We stay in touch with everybody. And literally, we bend over backwards for everybody. There's like no quibble. That's it. You know, I, And we want to explain the perfume to them because we're very proud of them. We want to explain how many absolutes they've actually got in this bottle. And we've got one perfume called Privé, which is like um, really the DNA of all Mondrian. It's got a lot of our main ingredients in it in tiny, minute proportion. It's a very well-balanced perfume. And you know, I want to tell them, you've got Jasmine Absolute, Rose Absolute, Gardenia Absolute, you've got all these, you know, Osmanthus Absolute. So I want them to know what they're getting. And, uh, you know, it's a, good, it's a good relationship. And I think that's why we're quite close to all our clients. I think also... That's why they stay quite loyal to us. Yeah, I think you're extending their life as well. Um, tell me, you know, which, which, which an innovative product. Tell me about your passion for innovation. Where does it extend to? And, and give me a few examples of innovations you're especially proud of introducing. Well, first of all, our signature perfume, Ormond Woman, Ormond Man, that used at the very beginning was just one perfume, and it was called Ormond. Um, we made it our signature because it came from Hemlock. And there wasn't another perfume in the world made from hemlock, which is obviously Socrates' chosen poison. So, yeah. you know, 
that there was a, you know, it was all, you know, there was a bit of a romantic side to it. So when I came across the hemlock, I was very excited about that because I just thought, well, this is very Ormond Jane. If somebody comes into the boutique and says, you know, I like sandalwood or cedarwood, we'd say, well, we've got hemlock, you know, and, and so it became our signature. And during my travels, I, I came across the oud, which is at, there was an attar. So in the Middle East, um, the Middle Eastern gentlemen and ladies um, like the attar. It's a very strong um, scent. It comes from Cambodia and Laos, from the agar tree. When I came across it, um, I just realized it hadn't been made into a fine fragrance. A fine fragrance meaning a, a bottle of perfume with many ingredients. It was always just one ingredient, little bottle, dark, dark oil, very expensive, very pungent. And also occasionally um, in that region, they would mix it with taif oil, which is a rose from that region as well, taif from, from Arabia. So I bought the taif rose in, I bought the oud in, I did a, a, a reconnaissance, I went off to Laos, I did all my research about the agar tree, I went down to Nana where they actually do the extraction, got to know the people or the dealers, and then I brought it back to London and we made, um, uh, we, we created Ormond Man using the most minute amount in it because I didn't think the Europeans would care for it too much. So we put in like 0.001%. Everybody was very interested in these ingredients. Um, I had lots of people come into the boutique. I got a, like two full pages in um, the How to Spend It Financial Times about this oil. Wow. Lots of people called me and asked me if I could be a consult, um, consult for them to see what it is. And then now it's a confirmed category. And we've made some more perfumes with it now. The Europeans and the rest of them, they actually have embraced it. They like it. If you like strong perfumes, that is. It's not for everybody. So we have the Nawab of Oud. We have the Ormond with 1% um, pure Cambodian Oud in it. Um, I've got an Oud dealer. And um, he, he sends me the oud and we have it tested for purity before we part with any money because it's around £20,000. So it's tested for purity and then um, we use it into, in the perfumery. So we introduce oud into the perfume industry and today it's a confirmed category. We introduce the taif rose into a rose perfume, into a fine fragrance. Um, so, and then, you know, and the hemlock. So all these, all these things, you know, I, I feel that, um, you know, when you come across something new and you think, oh, I know that will work. And, and you, you know, when you feel this natural, uh, right, I can get my teeth into this, this is going to be amazing. Of course, it's all very exciting, isn't it? And the second perfume that was made with Oud after mine was um, Yves Saint Laurent. They did a perfume called M7 uh, a few months later. And now, like I said, nearly every perfume house um, Chanel, Christian Dior, every perfume house has oud perfumes now. Aye. Uh, you always seem to have been forward thinking. And I did like the decision you made in 2005 to make your entire collection gender free. Now, that was yes. very brave of you at that time. Yes. What brought yes. you to that decision? And how su well, successful has it been? It's been very well. I had two back to back. Uh, complaints. Um, one was a gentleman came into the boutique. Um, he was quite a burly looking man and sat down and he was trying all the perfumes and he picked San Paquita, which is a very light, fruity floral. This is, I'm going back to 2004, 2005, very, very early on, maybe 2007. I'm, I actually can't remember, but very, a long time ago. And I remember thinking, why does this man want to smell like this? I can't understand it. Um, and I was about to say to him, you know, do you want to smell something, you know, a little bit more robust or a little bit? And then I, I just thought to myself, who am I to tell this man how he should smell? And um, he went off and he bought the San Paquita, a fruity floral with peaches and light cheese and San Paquita is the national flower of the Philippines. It's botanically related to jasmine. It's a much bigger flower. And I was a bit astounded, actually. And I remember going home and saying to my husband, you know, I didn't expect him to buy that perfume. And then about a month later in Harrods, um, one of my um, um, a team sold a bottle of Taif Rose perfume. 
And I got a phone call from the gentleman afterwards. He said, I like the perfume, but I feel that your staff uh, deliberately sold me a woman's perfume on, you know, on purpose just to make the sale. And I'm really upset. He said, I went online and I saw that your Taif Rose was under the ladies section. And it, you know, they didn't tell me it was a ladies perfume. And I'm, you know, I'm very upset. Uh, and obviously it was just done to make the sale. So I said, right, I get that. And you know what? I am now going to call my um, uh, internet guy and I'm going to tell him to do away with the male and female because it's nonsense. I said, in the last couple of months, I've come across this situation so often where I'm thinking, you know, why on earth does he want to buy that perfume? And now you're offended. So I have to react to this criticism. I had to try and come up with a name because I didn't really like the unisex um, uh, thing. So eventually I came up with the idea of gender free. And I told the, um, our web designer to take off the female and male and make it gender free. And then I wrote out a little piece in our training manual and told all our staff and all our people all over the world that from now on, all Ormond Jane perfumes are gender free and nobody is to be judged about what they like. If it's, you know, if they like it, let them buy it. It's up to them. It's not up to us. So it was, it was a good decision, actually brave one at the time then and um, let's talk about leadership which is obviously the title of our show meet the leader you are head of a team of 33 with many of them long serving yes. what's your style of leadership given your commitment to quality and passion about your brands yes. are you a micromanager or do you encourage your team members to make decisions themselves how hard is it having such a large yes. blend of friends and family in the team it is it is it has it has been hard so um, I've got a very good right-hand man called Scott and we split up the um, obligations between us. Uh, with the staff, if they, you know, he, he, he employs and he does all the, anything that is, you know, if, if somebody has to have some sort of disciplinary, that's his department and I don't get involved. Um, when we're training the staff, we always say, everyone whoever comes into the boutique or whoever you're serving or whoever talks about Ormond Jane you must treat everybody like they're an A1 celebrity no matter what they look like no matter who they are if they've entered our boutique if they've come to buy something if they've telephoned us we should be grateful for that they are A1 celebrities as far as I am concerned and you also have to treat each other in a very respectful way we will respect you all the way. We try to accommodate all their wishes and we try to accommodate them at every level if possible because even though we've got 30 odd members of staff, we can actually maneuver quite quickly because there isn't a lot of hierarchy. So it's either down to me or to Scott. So we react like this really quickly. So that, that helps a lot. But Scott is in charge of um, the staff I'm in charge of innovation, creation, PR, marketing, et cetera. And so we keep it separate and that helps a lot. So if there's any grievances, then they don't come to me. I always say, um, Scott will deal with it. And it's, the, it's better that way because then it's just the two steps, you know, where we keep it like that. And Scott's very fair minded. He's very different to me, which is good. Um, He's, he's, he, he sees things in a different way to me. So it, we're very good yin and yang. Right. I'm probably a bit of a soft touch. <laughs> so, so, and uh, Scott is, is kind hearted. He's very sweet. He throws the Christmas parties. On one Jane's famous for their Christmas parties all over London. I think there's one nightclub we haven't been thrown out of. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, but uh, but um, he, he's, he's very fair. He's a fair minded person. Yeah. I like that. Another thing that stood out for me is that you appear to have cracked the work-life balance, running a business with global customers and having a happy family life. What's your secret? Yes. What's the secret? Well, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds, but I'd live by a few rules. Um, my, my rule was always, you know, when my children wake up in the morning, I, I want to be the first person they see. I want to have breakfast with them and I want to take them to school. And at nighttime, when they go to sleep, I want them to I want to be the last person they see and I'll read them a story. Um, so I've managed to stick to that, I would say, about 95 percent of the year. 
um, which is good. Now they're grown up and actually they don't want me to say goodnight to them anymore. <laughs> but anyway, time <laughs> moves on. I also make a point of setting my alarm clock at work. So um, come 3.30, 4 o'clock, um, the alarm goes off. I set my telephone and that's my 10 minute warning. So I, no more calls, take the telephone off, close down my computer and I say goodbye. And I either go home or go to the gym, get changed out of my work clothes, put on a different hat. We're very big on cooking in our house. We're very big on eating as well. And um, we're always talking about food and what we're going to make, what we're going to cook, what we're going to marinade. We always analyze what we've cooked and what we've made and what we could do better. Next time we roast that or do this or do that and everything. So it's a big part of our family life and for the children. So we, we, we sit around the table every night, um, all laid up, everything. There's no phones on the table, nothing. It's, everybody comes to the table. We have chats. And then we all muck in, tidying up and putting the dishwasher on. And, and that's so we keep it. You know, I've got this, this rule to live by. And I do leave because I, I just think, you know, I, it's perfume. It's not life threatening you know and you know if I if I you know sign up at half three four o'clock I can always pick it up the next day of course I have to pick up my um telephone in the evening you know answer a few emails but it's you know these days the technology is so fantastic you know you can just have your telephone on you and say absolutely no problem call you tomorrow bye for now you know so so life goes on mm. yeah I, I love that my, my wife Kim uh, followed it in some ways, a similar thing, you know, we all had to sit down with our children at dinner time and then talk to each other. And now we're finding our children are doing the same with our grandchildren. Yes, is, um, good it, habits. It, yeah, great habit. Look, how has yeah. the coronavirus pandemic crisis impacted you and your company, if at all? Mm. After all, many retailers yes, are having to close or cut back, aren't they? That's right. So, I mean, you know, obviously, like everybody else, we've never known anything like it. We, you know, we had to react quickly. And the beauty of having like a, a, a company that's like got like one owner and one manager, we can react very fast. And um, we've got 200 points of sales around the world, the whole lot closed down. Um, I was fortunate in so much, uh, there was two companies that owed me quite a lot of money and they did both paid. Thank goodness, but the the, the bank balance uh, was in quite a healthy situation before this all happened. So I think with the combination of having a good bank balance, being in a strong position as a company before COVID, um, we just had to decide very quickly how we're going to react to this. Most of the staff went out on furlough, and I kept three members of staff working. Um, answering the phones and I had one person doing the internet orders um, so we kept picking along and I was you know we all stayed in touch with each other I had people that owed me money and they said can we have longer terms I said yes of course and I in turn had to speak to my landlords and say you know I can't pay the rent I'm closed there's no money coming in this time is gone forever this money isn't going to come back it's mm. not like when I open, it's just going to suddenly reappear. This, this time is gone. These sales have gone. And, you know, and you want me to pay rent. So I, uh, one, so where our studios are, they, they insisted on full rent, but they said you can pay at the end of the year. Um, so, you know, that, that, you know, you've got to take it. That's all there is to it. But I did actually have, um, two members of staff there doing the internet orders and, and manning the phones. Um, and um, with my boutique in Old Bond Street, um, the, the landlord uh, made a deal for everybody in our arcade. And, you know, we, we had to, you know, uh, go with that. But it didn't take away the fact that we're paying rent and, you know, we're closed. You know what I mean? So now slowly but surely we started to open again some of the boutiques in europe have started to open the sales are not great because um as you can imagine there's no tourists around so when we first opened i think it was early june in bond street it was absolutely dead um, and then uh, when the government allowed um, the restaurants and hospitality to reopen we saw a bit more life because it's you know shopping in old bond street it's a bit of an event you go out meet your friends, have a glass of champagne, 
do some you know fancy shopping go for lunch it, it it's it's um a very nice you know meeting point to see your friends so the restaurants opening helped but there you don't see any tourists at all so it is still you know weirdly quiet we're not taking a lot of money in the boutique at all but we are taking good internet sales so you know i'm just thinking that i have to react to this and going forward i might have to think how can i improve online sales what can i do to bring online sales more you know maybe i should be on these nice, you know, you've got these lovely websites like Netta Porter, Mr. Porter. You know, I'm not on any of these websites. Maybe I have to think about that and see if they'll have me. And um, so it will help protect me in the future if something like this happens again, because you never know. I'm not talking about a second wave. Um, I'm talking about an, another virus that yeah. might pop up in yeah. a few years' time, yeah. you know. So, you know, the viruses in the past never really um, came to us. Like Ebola was pretty nasty, but you. You didn't travel because you were so ill with it. You, you practically died so quickly. So it didn't become a pandemic per se. But with this virus, it's quite different because some people can carry COVID and they don't even know they're ill. Mm. So, yeah. so, and, and then they're going to spread it. So, so it's like that. So we have to just think of the future, really. Yeah. And I, I'm totally with you on, on the change that's happening because I've interviewed uh, over 100 CEOs, MDs in the last three months. And all of them have been to been interviewed from home. Um, yes. Some yes. of them, but my, by the way, in their villas in France or something. Like yes. that. But <laughs> every single one of them has been saying that they've been doing all their shopping online and, and mm. they're used to it now. And they're thinking how they're going to change the setup of the way of working. So you're right. Look, you are a very successful British company. Do you see Brexit as an opportunity or a threat? And why your choice of either? By the way, I am seeing it as opportunity for you. Yes. Well, I would like to see, um, well, first of all, we are a very well-respected brand and, and we are British and we, that's our, we're playing to our strengths here. Um, I think that it would be great if there's no tariffs um, because that would be very helpful. Um, I don't, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Um, at the beginning of Brexit, um, I didn't want to leave Europe. I love Europe and um, I'm traveling there all the time. And then I think like a lot of people, after it went on for so long, everybody's thinking, you know, <laughs> let's just leave and everything because it became so tiresome and so exhausting. I found it very difficult for me because... Um, you never knew what was going to happen. So when you thought that Brexit's around the corner, it's about to happen, I mean, I think some point, was it this year or last year? I can't remember, maybe last year. I um, I actually stopped up on a lot of um, oils from, from France, thinking that um, if Brexit happens, as, we, as, as in Theresa May thought it was going to happen, um, I thought if I can't get my oils out of France, I can't supply the whole world. I can't supply Russia, America, Vietnam. I mean, it's not just Europe coming in and out. I buy components from Europe and vice versa. So I really stopped up and that actually gave me a massive problem because then I had to pay the bill. And uh, I had paid, I had actually purchased about 100% more than I would normally purchase, thinking that... Um, I don't want to get caught short and I need to be able to keep supplying the world. So I found the whole Brexit uh, scenario that's gone on for such a long time, a real nuisance. And I'm just hoping now that we can come out of this with a good trade deal and um, not too much paperwork. And then we can play to our strengths. And my strengths obviously is we're British. We manufacture in Britain. We're very well respected around the world. And we'll, we will play on our strengths. We'll, we'll, we'll play that up. Yeah, I'm totally yeah. with you on playing up the UK branding. Yeah. yeah. What's your vision for Almond Jane in, say, five years' time? Still independent, still innovative, branching out into new products or areas? Well, um, five years' time. So um, I'd like to think of myself still independent because I think I've got a long way to go. But... Um, I do like to be very nimble and flexible. So I've always been open-minded about every aspect of the business. 
Um, I've always told everybody, I like the independence. I like owning the company. It's a joy to work, you know, because I know the manufacturers, I know the growers, I know all my retailers, I know all the buyers from the department store. So actually, as a company, it's very enjoyable. So it'd be hard to give it up. But you never know what's going to happen in the world. So I would like to think that um, I could be independent, but I would like to stay um, nimble and fast. We don't ha actually have any outside investors. And um, so we're not answerable to anybody. So if things change over the next five years, I can change rapidly. Um, and I think that's the best way to be actually, to, you know, to have that uh, flexibility. Um, sustainability has come up quite a lot. So about a year and a half ago, Selfridges brought that up to us and they said, you know, anybody that can come up with good sustainability ideas, we can give you a bigger space. And um, it was a great opportunity. Now, uh, Scott and I reacted to this like within about 48 hours. And we just sat down, came up with an idea, sent it out to them. She was like, oh, wow. OK, I didn't expect such a, a quick reaction. But we'd already come up with the idea. It's going to be this. You can have your bottles refilled. You can choose a different kind of bottle. You can choose this. You can choose that. You can name your perfume. And she was like, OK, well, you know, you're the first person to come back to me. She, and then she said nobody actually reacted for about three months. So we're, we're very uh, we're very quick off the mark. Mm, and agile, I think in the agile. Next, yeah, very agile. And I think over the next five years, the agility of, of the company structure, whatever happens, we'll be able to maneuver very, very quickly. Ideally, I'd like to be independent, but... I'm open-minded, never say no about anything. I don't, I don't want to be sort of like narrow-minded about anything. I still want to travel. I want to continue with what we're doing. And, you know, you never know with technology what's going to happen, do you? I mean, it's, it goes so well. Here we are on, on Zoom. You know, at this time last year, I'd never even heard of Zoom. And I'd never spoken to anybody live on any technology. You know, I was like the last person to get a mobile phone. Right. But you see, you've just hit it on the nail, uh, right on the head there, um, agility, because all the research, all the talk from the big um, consultants like McKinsey saying the yes. winners will be the most agile for the future. Yes. I have to ask you this before we get to our last question. Tell me the story behind Gourmand Jane. What is it and uh, what's your vision for Gourmand it? Gourmand Jane. Yeah. Uh, Gourmand Jane's just a bit of fun, really. Ah, um, right. This was like um, me, you know, uh, I love cooking and I was just chatting to girlfriends and you know what it's like after a few drinks, you know, your, your, your ideas run wild. And I said, to, you know, I just said, um, you know, I, you know, it would be quite interesting to experiment cooking with perfume to see what it tastes like. You know, I can change recipes and put in um, edible oils to see, you know, so you've got an aromatic perfumery aspect to it like an Ormond Jane, Bormon Jane. And my girlfriend said, that's a very clever um, idea. And Bormon Jane sounds like Bormon Jane, Ormond Jane. So then what I started doing was every time I went around Europe to visit one of my retailers, whatever region I was in, I was used to say to them, like, okay, tell me what is your, like, your speciality dish from let's say Vincenza or, or from Milan or Naples. So like when we we're in Naples, I went out, um, they told me that in Naples, it's all about um, mozzarella and I uh, went into this lovely restaurant and we had this lovely dish um, it was a big apple, it'd been carved out, they had mozzarella balls inside, homemade pesto, and then they put the uh, balls of apple back inside. It was absolutely delicious, it looked incredible. And I was thinking it'd be fun to photograph it, copy it, but then use perfumery in it. And so I just, I just started doing that as a bit of fun, really. But I, I, really love, I, 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 I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm waiting for the Gourmand Jane uh, per champagne as well to go with it all. Uh, you know? And then you've got yes, everything to like everything that. to give to the lady of your life. Lind Linda, enough of the heavy questions. It's three wishes time. What are your three wishes for the future of the quality perfumery business? Um, I am so. Um, well, one of them is we, we're, we're quite highly regulated and uh, we never used to be. Um, now, there's a lot of things you can't do in perfume. You can make the most beautiful creation, but it doesn't pass the IFRA. 
and there's a lot of restrictions and more and more restrictions are coming through. So I would like to see less regulation and less restrictions on creativity in the perfume industry. Second wish, I think it would be really marvelous for the United Kingdom if we had our own perfume schools at university, which we don't seem to have. So you, you've got perfume schools in, in, in France and everything. I think we should have a university course because, you know, the United Kingdom, we're very creative people. I mean, we're fantastic at films and music and creativity. So I think we should have a nice uh, university for perfumery. I don't see why not. And I suppose my biggest wish is probably going to be that we get a good trade deal um, shipping in and out of Europe and no tariffs. That would be very helpful. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Linda Bilkenden of Ormondin, I have thoroughly enjoyed finding out about you and about your dynamic business. Thank you for the interview. Oh, no, thank you, Malcolm. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. It's been, you know, I'm a Zoom, I'm a Zoom queen now. <laughs> <laughs>